Schneiderite. Schneiderite. There we go. I got it. Um, she is an associate professor at the University of Maryland, where she emphasizes patient safety for pre-licensure and advanced practice nursing students through simulation-based education. She is actively engaged in the state and national simulation activities, including the MCSRC and um, SSIH, and founding member of the National Organization of Nurse Practitioner Faculties Simulation Committee. Um, her work with the NLN began as a 2015 sim leader and has continued with editorial advisory board for the NLN Center for Innovation in Simulation and Technology. Um, I know she's uh, authored the Thomas Sykes scenario, which I've used and really found useful. Um, recently, she was published, and I was just congratulating her as you guys were joining in which journal was that? Tanya? Nursing Forum. Nursing Forum on. Um, operations of simulation. It's a very comprehensive article. I'm sure we can give you a reference. We're actually highlighting it through MCSRC's Journal Club next week. So welcome, Tanya. We're excited to have you here to speak to us about curriculum integration. Thank you. Thanks, Jaslyn. And thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited um, to be here with all of you today. And I think that um, just a couple of, of housekeeping things. Um, one is because we are all virtual, um, there may be a time where you have a comment that you want to um, put forward. I want for this to be a very open discussion. Um, and so just feel free to, to turn your camera back on and to ask your question. Um, don't, don't be inhibited about um, interrupting the, the, the flow of the presentation. Um, for many of you, this is gonna be a repeat because you've already heard this information. Um, but I was just, I am taking a course right now this week on um, translational research. And a lot of the, the content that we talked about today were things that I already knew, but I listened and there were just a couple of nuggets that, that struck me differently than they had in the past. So I'm hoping that if this is something that you can relate to that, um, you may take away another little piece, piece of knowledge that um, can apply to something that you're doing now. So um, also to say that I am living in a condominium right now with other family members. So I have warned them not to interrupt me, but sometimes people forget. So if people come in, um, I may have to pause for a moment, but fingers crossed that won't happen. So let's begin. And we're talking about curricular integration. All right. So our objectives, simple, there's only two. One, to describe the rationale supporting curricular integration. And then the second is to delineate how the MCSRC curriculum alignment map that we developed at the inception of the MCSRC, how it can be used for curricular integration. Um, and also to let you know, I've got my chat box open. So if you wanted to type in a question, you're welcome to do that as well. Okay, so what I would like, and since I cannot see your hands, um, if you can, actually, I'm going to go into, I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment because I want to see some faces. So turn your cameras back on and raise your hand if you integrate simulation into your programs. Oh, all right, lots of hands. Lots of people integrate simulation into your program. All right, unmute yourself and tell me what that means to you. What does curricular integration mean for those of you who are doing it? Aligning with the objectives of the program and also of the course. Okay, aligning with the program outcomes and the course outcomes. Mm -hmm. We're okay. looking for gaps in um, either our content or their experiences in clinical and enhancing or filling those gaps with things that we can control in simulation. Okay, so filling the gaps with something that's leveled, something that's standardized, um, that can be consistent in your program. Okay, how else are you integrating? Um, we actually, from Stevenson, supplement 
clinical with simulation. We pull students out and they go to, they do their simulation as a clinical day. Okay, and so is the whole group coming? Um, so the whole so, clinical group is coming? Or are you pulling out just a, a small yeah, number two, of students and you're combining two. those groups? Right. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Anyone else? How about my hospital friends? Deb, I see you. Oh, and you're muted. Thank you. I'm sorry. I said, yeah, I was laughing. I said, I'm waiting for you to point me out. I'm trying to hide. <laughs> so not too bad. <laughs> I think I'm a minority here with the practice side. So um, for the practice side, yes, we look at, um, you know, needs on the unit and we look at what has been reported through quality um, as a need for the nursing. And so we take those factors and we use that as part of our curriculum and incorporate that into their simulation um, to be able for safety issues and, and um, have better outcomes for our patients. Okay, so based on a needs assessment, you figure out sort of what you need to do and, and integrate that into the simulation. Yes. Okay, anybody else? Okay, all right. You, you, can, you can go back and turn your cameras off. Thank you. All right, let me go back to sharing my screen here. And let me pull my chat box back down again. Okay. All right, so what we just heard from everyone is a diverse way to define curricular integration. There's no one way that anyone is saying that they are integrating simulation into their curriculum. And that is something that we found back in 2015. So as Jaslyn said in my introduction, I was a part of the 2015 NLN Sim Leaders Program. And our group focused on curricular integration because what we found was, again, there was no one definition. Does it mean that you have simulation integrated within a course? Does it mean you have it integrated within a series of courses, like all of your medical surgical courses have simulation? Or is it integrated within the entire program? And with every expert that we interviewed, we found out that there was no one definition. That's a problem because we, the standards of best practice are evidence-based documents. And so if we don't have a consensus on what integration means, then we can't create this body of evidence, this body of knowledge to then support a standard of best practice. We're not speaking the same language when we're talking about curricular integration. And so what we have to do right now is resort to the standards that are out there that address some aspect of curricular integration. And so I'm gonna highlight three of them. And these are all from the Anaxal Standards of Best Practices. And what you will see are these beautiful designs, the, these symphographics um, that my friend Colette Boise Dahl and her team designed. Um, and you can also go to the Anaxal website and you can order these. Um, I have been to some institutions where uh, they have a single debriefing room and they have all of these symphographs around the room so that they're surrounded um, both literally and figuratively by the standards of best practices. So if you're not familiar, I encourage you to go to the Anaxal website and check them out. But the first one to talk about is simulation design. And so um, aspects that apply are criterion one, that you perform a needs assessment to provide the foundational evidence of the need for a well-designed simulation-based experience. So in thinking about that, we're going to address a need, and this goes back to what Deb was talking about at GBMC, they do a needs assessment and figure out what is it that we need to address. Lena said something very similar, that, that we're trying to capture aspects that we can't put into the classroom or can't encompass in didactic learning, but something that's better addressed experientially. The second one from the SIM design standard is to construct measurable objectives. 
And so when we think about the needs assessment that, that is going to address that particular aspect, now we need to create those objectives that are going to encompass that. And then the third is to structure the format of a simulation-based experience on the purpose, the theory, and the modality of the simulation-based experience. So I'm gonna come back to that purpose statement. Why are we doing this? What is the reason? And the reason that I am pointing that out with such emphasis is because many of us have been asked on numerous occasions to fill in simulation for aspects of clinical that um, aren't necessarily purposeful. And what I mean by that is you get the call from the clinical instructor to say, the hospital is, um, they're getting a visit uh, from the commission, the joint commission, and they can't have students come in, so we need to use SIM instead. The problem with that is they're expecting to just have an experience for the students that's not based on the needs assessment, that has objectives, that is purposefully thought about to be integrated into the curriculum. Another one of the ANAXEL standards that somewhat addresses curricular integration is the outcomes and objective standard. And this is what I talked about before with the SIM design. So all simulation-based experiences begin with the development of measurable objectives designed to achieve expected outcomes. And these have to follow the SMART format, that they're specific, that they're measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-based. Many of us have been asked as simulation educators to encompass a whole bunch of objectives that the course faculty can't get um, through experiential learning, either in a clinical setting or some other format. And so they have this list of eight to 10 objectives that they want for us to achieve in simulation. That's not possible in a simulation that lasts about 15 to 20 minutes. So you want to think about designing a simulation that can meet three to five objectives. That's realistically what you can achieve. Because remember too, that we're going to be debriefing based on those objectives, based on what it is that we expect the students to experience. And so if we have this litany of, of objectives, there's no way that, that we will set them up for success. And then the third, the last little piece here is participant evaluation standard. And so that's thinking about how you're gonna evaluate at the very beginning when you're designing this. So are you going to have this be a formative simulation, a summative simulation, or a high stakes simulation? And again, that goes back to this purposeful integration of simulation into your course. And so with that, I wanna pause for just a moment and allow people to ask questions. So you can either say a question verbally, you can unmute yourself, you can type a question in the, in the chat box. And I'm gonna give just a moment or two for people to ask questions so far. Tanya, I have a quick question for you. Um, it's Deb. And I'm not sure if it's a stupid question or not, but I understand the formative, summative, and high stakes evaluations, but I guess I really want to understand it when it comes to a practice setting, um, because we don't evaluate that way, because it's really more of teaching and educating, so they understand how to do the right thing at the bedside. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And those simulations would be formative, right, because it's about the learning. You expect that they're, okay. the outcome is that they would have learned that procedure, learned how to use that new piece of equipment, learned um, the new protocols for whatever your hospital is instituting. So, um, you know, okay, when you're gotcha. in your situation, I wouldn't, I'm, I, first of all, my bias is I am not a fan of high stakes evaluations. I, I think that, that um, there's rarely a case that can, in my mind, be built for high stakes evaluation and simulation. However, um, there are opportunities or, or times where you would want to do a summative evaluation, but I think in, in what you're doing there in the hospital, it would mostly be performative. Does that make sense? 
it, it really honestly does make sense. And um, maybe the summative and the high stakes, um, I see a little bit more towards um, in the residency program. I have a director of medical education, and when he is having somebody in the residency program, maybe a new intern or something that is really not cutting it and can't, they're afraid they're not going to make it up to a next level, they really do bring them in and really do more of a high stakes to see if they're going to move forward or if they're going to be held back in the program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and there are um, some murmurings about. Um, the NCLEX and moving forward that they will start, they are considering putting simulation into their competency assessments and, wow. and passing the NCLEX. I don't see this for years to come um, because we've got to, you know, think about how to make it um, uh, an evaluation method that's consistent across the board, but it is something that's being considered. So we need to start thinking about how we can best prepare our students and once they get into practice, how to make them the safest practitioners possible. Wow. Any other questions? Okay. And I apologize to, um, to the, my two practice colleagues because this is really academically focused, but I appreciate Debbie bringing up that question and please, I encourage both of you to, um, to ask questions as it applies to practice. All right, uh, the next is um, why, why do we care, again, about curricular integration? And when we think about the um, CCNE standards, so the accreditation standards, there is in standard 3G, it speaks specifically to simulation. So we want to have teaching and learning practices that support the achievement of student outcomes, that expose students um, to different experiences and the elaboration there is that the teaching and learning practices including simulation support the achievement of expected student outcomes identified in your course unit and or your level objectives so again speaking to that purposeful integration of simulation not just something that we're doing because somebody called us but we've thought about this in the design and we are purposeful in our integration Dr. Coppage, do you have a question? No, okay. I just see your face there. It's nice to see you. Thank you. Okay, moving on a little bit. Um, just to, to address this bottom part here in the CCNA standard, again, that teaching learning practices are appropriate to the student population. So consider the needs of the program and the identified community of interest. So going back and thinking about our hospital partners, what is it that they are seeing that we are not addressing? How is it that our students are not being prepared um, in what they're seeing in the clinical setting? So, and, and then thinking backwards, what is it that we can do to address those needs? And so I found this um, definition and it speaks just a little bit to what I'm trying to capture here. So an integrated curriculum, is one that connects different areas of study by cutting across subject matter lines and emphasizing unifying concepts. So to say that what we're doing in simulation is gonna go across our curriculum. It's not just going to be in, a, in one course and that's the only place that we're gonna do it. We're gonna to try to be purposeful. And I, I'm gonna say that word about 20 more times. We need to make sure that we are doing this in a purposeful way that will span our curriculum. And so here's a handy way for you to do this. Um, and so for those of you who have been, well, all of you have been through the NCSRC um, and through the Simulation Education Leaders Program. And this is a worksheet that we developed way back at the inception of, um, of the NCSRC. And so I'm gonna walk you through this a little bit. But what I like most about this is it's a visual representation of how you are being purposeful in integrating your simulation across the course and how that fits in with the overall program. So that when your accreditors come and when they ask about simulation, and they will, you'll be able to demonstrate to them how it's, it's been mapped out and thoughtfully considered as it's been integrated. So I'm gonna give you a bit of an example of one that I've used in the past. 
Um, so at the University of Maryland, the way that we run our simulations is we have students come in in four hour blocks. And we use um, about the first two hours to run one of the simulations in debrief. And then we use the second two hours to run another simulation in debrief. And when I first joined the faculty, they had two pediatric simulations and both of those simulations address the exact same objectives. So in essence, we were spending four hours in two simulations meeting the exact same objectives. The difference between the two simulations were the diagnosis of the patient. So one was uh, asthma, respiratory uh, distress, and the other one was an adolescent who was uh, post-op appendectomy. But nowhere in their objectives were we talking about the disease process nor the growth and development of the two different age, age groups. And so um, when, when I mapped it out, it became really obvious. And this provided information that I could take back to the course faculty to say, let's try and think of a different way that we can do this. And what we ended up doing was we took the patient in the beginning who had uh, respiratory distress. She um, is uh, now a, um, a preschooler. And we follow her from her uh, in-house visit to a home visit. And so we've exposed the students then to a whole different set of objectives. So I'm gonna walk you through the map and give you um, an idea of how we did this. And in thinking about how you would do this in the, um, in the practice side, you would, um, it, it's a little tricky when we think about the program outcomes, but if you can um, align them with your residency program outcomes, you may be able to create this linear um, map uh, for practice as well. So in the far left column, the program and the institution and the course. So the program for us in this example is the BSN program. Um, we have other programs. We have a, a CNL program, graduates, nurse practitioners, etc. But for this map, we're using the BSN program. Our school is the University, University of Maryland School of Nursing and the course is Nursing 411. So the next thing that we want to do is go to our program outcomes. And so for this, our program outcomes are those that are, are aligned with the Bachelor of Science in Nursing program. Um, and so what you would do with this is you would, you would document each of the program outcomes and you will use different rows for different outcomes. But starting here can create the template that you can use over and over and over again for different courses because your program outcomes are never gonna change as long as you align them with the, the same program. So are we, are we good so far? Any questions? I do have a question. This is Latasha. Yes, ma'am. So um, just, um, and you probably will answer this later, but I just wanted to know if you were using this um, for each simulation or for each course. So we use this for, what I did is use this for each course. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you as I, as I get into my simulation learning outcomes, how I've mapped it to the two different simulations. Okay. And we'll see if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Okay. So now comes a little bit of a, a trickier aspect. You have to get your course syllabus and you have to figure out where those course objectives align to the program objectives. And so in this one, it's course outcome with numbered course objectives. And the reason it's important to have the numbered course objectives is because when your course faculty are writing their syllabi, they're not putting them in an alignment that's automatically going to map to the program objectives. And so if you have the number of your course objectives with it, then you can readily find it when you go back to the syllabus. Otherwise, you're, you're trying to, to find where is applied knowledge of humanities, social science, and nursing. And so for these, number four, number five, and number 10, there's not going to be a direct match, but there's going to be some correlation that will make that course outcome align with the program outcome. 
So for number four, you're applying knowledge of humanities, social science, and nursing and delivering nursing care to infants, children, and the family across the wellness illness continuum. And then if you look at the program outcomes, you can see that sciences, humanities, um, and focusing on health promotion and prevention of disease for individuals, family, families, and communities and populations. So that folds into that nicely. The next one is define and apply selected developmental and family theories when analyzing behaviors of infants, children, and families. So again, that can be folded into the program outcomes and the same with number 10. So as you can see, I've got four, five, and 10 of the course outcomes that align with one of the program outcomes for this BSN program. And so then what you wanna do is you wanna pull out what, what concept is similar in these. And so health promotion and family-centered care are concepts that span the program outcomes and the course outcomes. And so now we can think about simulation that has learning outcomes that align. And so the simulation learning outcomes were to uh, demonstrate teaching and counseling abilities when providing health promotion and education to children and their families. And then for family-centered care, using critical thinking strategies and tools in the decision-making process when planning and implementing nursing care of infants and children in the context of their families. And what you will see, and this goes back to the, the previous question, is in parentheses it says LR2. And so that means that these simulation learning outcomes apply to the second simulation that we did. So Lily Rosner, LR2, her pediatric home visit. Okay. And again, going back to my previous example, all of the ones that we had had prior to making this change, they all aligned with the similar course outcomes. There weren't any differences between the two simulations, which for me is not a, um, an appropriate use of those four hours. You want to cover as much ground as possible. I'm going to pause here for questions. Does this make sense so far? So Tonya, um, this is Nancy. I don't really have, I don't have questions, uh, but um, I appreciate this presentation and I wanted to say hi. I'm sorry I was a little bit late, so I didn't get to say hi at the beginning of the, of the conversation. So anyway. Um, hi Dreamboat. Yeah, this is a, a really good uh, uh, worksheet. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, so I'm gonna keep going. And so this is just looking again at another row. So looking at other program outcomes to integrate competencies, then the next row to the right, apply interpersonal and communication skills. That's the course outcome. And then what concepts are we pulling out? And then how can we make simulation objectives that will fit into those? And I'm happy to make this uh, PowerPoint available to you all after this is over. We can post it on our website as okay. well. Great. Tonya, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, when this um, concept map is set up, is this done by the um, simulation instructor, the course instructor combination? So you can do it in whatever way works best for you and your group. Um, what I did is I, I did the, the entire worksheet myself okay. so that I could go back and demonstrate to the course faculty why it didn't make sense to have two simulations that were the same. Okay. Um, but again, if you have, it's what, what I did at my previous institution is I sat down with the course faculty and we said, all right, let's look at your, let's look at the program outcomes. Let's look at your course outcomes because Sometimes if you don't have a curriculum committee who is really um, keeping a close eye on making sure that there is an alignment, mm -hmm. you may have instructors that sort of go off the rails and create their own objectives that don't really make sense. So yeah. this would be a great opportunity to say that, let, let's talk about how that's gonna align with the program. And maybe we can restructure the wording so that it fits a little bit better. Good points. 
Um, so, you know, in that, in that instance, I think it would be a great collaboration. And then you can work together to figure out what those objectives are and uh, the concepts and objectives. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any hey, other Tanya. questions? Yes. Hi, this is Karen. Hi, Karen. Um, hi there. Um, I just had a question about your concepts and threads. Um, mm -hmm. I was just interested in, in those. It looks like some of them are QSIN. Perhaps, and then um, I was just, I liked your social justice, and I just wondered if you had any resources or references you would recommend for that. Right, so um, you bring up an excellent point. QSIN competencies or the, the QSIN concepts are really great ones um, to integrate. Um, in all honesty, it really sort of evolves from that alignment between your program and your course outcomes. Um, and hopefully there will be pieces of, of um, competencies, either QSIN um, from CCNE, that can be integrated. Um, but there, there isn't any one standard that we use to, to fill in the competencies. So I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have a really straightforward answer there. Um, but I, I would encourage you to go back to your accreditation documents and find out um, exactly what, um, what the expectations are for your program and then go back to that needs assessment that we talked about with the, the first um, standard of best practice, the SIM design standard, and figure out where those gaps are. And then how, how is it that you can address the gaps and figure out what concepts you need in order to create a simulation and to meet those objectives. Does that make sense? Is that helpful, Karen? Yeah, yeah, thank you. You're yes, welcome. we we we're using QSIN, so some of them we we were mm -hmm. using, but I mm -hmm. um it looked like you have a little bit of an expanded list and so that's what I was interested in. Thank you. Yeah, it, and it truly is just trying to pull out some key phrases that aligned between the course outcomes and the program outcomes. Okay, anyone else? Okay. So going back to 2015 and um, working with my SIM leaders group, we did a, a global survey to try to figure out how people really defined uh, curricular integration. And what we developed was this stepwise model to say, let's just think about getting simulation into a single course and then try to get into, into another course and then another course and another course so that all courses throughout the curriculum have a simulation. And then you can start to think about ways to integrate more than one simulation into your course. So and starting with training the faculty so that they can understand the pedagogy of simulation and that this is a very unique way of teaching. Um, and it's not the same as um, pre-conference, um, pre post-conference clinical education. Um, individual coaching. So um, going back to um, uh, Deb's comment about what do you do this on your own? Do you do this in collaboration? If you sit down with your um, with your course faculty and work together with them, you can really help coach them through the process. And that ultimately will make your job easier. So the next time you go to incorporate another simulation into their course, it will make a little bit more sense. And they'll, they'll, um, they'll really be somebody that you can collaborate with. Um, and then you want to run the simulation scenarios once they're developed using the standards of best practice, meaning that you are going to test them. You're going to pilot run them in real time, in the real space, um, so that you can make sure that you can work out all of the kinks and all of the problems. I will tell you, this is a real bugaboo because um, sometimes the faculty one, don't really understand the value and the need for pilot testing because you don't pilot test when you're taking care of patients in the hospital. You've got to get in there and do it. But this is different from an educator's perspective because we have to make sure that all of the things that we've designed purposefully make sense and that they flow for our students. Um, and the things that don't work, you know, you, you can walk it through in your mind, but unless you walk it through in real time in the real space, 
then it's not necessarily going to show you uh, the problems that can arise. Uh, a question from Lena, how has uh, University of Maryland found funding to provide the coaching? It's not something that's funded. It is something that we just go when we, we sit down and work with faculty. So it's, um, it's something that's sort of built in. Now keep in mind that we have a dedicated simulation team. So this is our, this is our full time job is to work with faculty and work with students in simulation. Um, so after you've run the simulation, you're going to review, you're going to make sure everything makes sense, you're going to make sure that your cues are there the way that you expect them to, um, that um, you know the heart rate goes down in a way that makes sense, um, that the SATs go down, those kinds of things. Then you're going to revise it and you're going to rerun it, meaning you're going to pilot test it again to make sure that now all of those kinks are worked out, that it makes sense, that it's fixed, and you're going to run the simulation. And then once you've done all that and everybody is so happy about the way that things have worked out, you've got some, another champion on your team and then you can integrate it into another course. But for those of you who are just trying to get simulation into your programs, you're gonna to wanna to start with people who really see the value of simulation and you know who those people are on your faculty people who um, value this experiential learning, this, this way of experiential learning. So get them on board first, uh, and then you can work your way into the, to the laggards when we think about the um, diffusion of innovation. So I'm gonna pause here and see if anybody has questions about this model. Okay. So I'm gonna move on. Another thing that came out of that survey is the ability to really scaffold. And so Karen Curry, this might go back to one of your questions that you were asking earlier about some of the concepts. And so we did this, this survey again, and we, um, in part of the survey, we were asking faculty when they had uh, particular aspects integrated in, in different uh, parts of their curriculum. And so what we did then is we categorized those as being at the beginning of the program, sort of in the middle of the program or towards the end of the program and came up with these concepts and this, this way of scaffolding. Um, and so, you know, those that are at the very beginning of the nursing program, you're gonna wanna talk about professional values, um, safety, communication, and then as they get more towards those second and third semesters, um, thinking about ethical legal considerations, um, community awareness, translating evidence into practice, and then those towards the end. Uh, and this also speaks to my practice colleagues about leadership, outcomes evaluation, quality improvement kinds of things, um, impact of social trends. How is that impacting um, the way that we're caring for our patients? So what you can also do if you're limited on space and limited on time, get different levels of students together. So you can get beginning students and you can get concluding students. And you can have a couple of objectives that, that would speak to the beginners and a couple of objectives that speak to those that are getting ready to graduate and have them work together just like they would in the real clinical setting. Um, this is from a paper that Elena Harrington and I published back in 2017. Um, so that is um, part of the reference list as well that you all can take a look at. So now I'm thinking about coronavirus. How does all of this differ? Whether we're face-to-face -face or virtual. So I'm gonna open up that question to all of you. How does curricular integration differ when you're in a virtual situation. Is anybody in a virtual situation? So say that question again. So how does how does curricular integration differ? So if you think about the curriculum map, if you think about working with faculty to get simulation into, into their courses. How does it differ now that we're in a situation where we're not face-to-face, -face, but we're virtual? So I, I think probably your, um, your guiding principles that you talked about at the beginning are stay the same. 
Um, but I think that some of the, uh, the drive to, uh, to institute and, and uh, integrate simulation, virtual simulation into the curriculum, the drive to do it is, is stronger and people learn to appreciate it because all of a sudden it is a very, very helpful tool mm -hmm. at a time when you're having a hard time providing you know, um, valuable clinical experiences for your students. But, um, but I, th I think your principles, your guiding principles stay the same. Mm -hmm. you have, it has to be based on meeting the the program class course outcomes and uh and as long as people are very careful doing that i think it can be fairly consistent you know it can be at the same some very similar process mm -hmm. yeah i agree thank you nancy absolutely jessen what were you going to say yeah and i i really think this is an opportune time you know if you haven't really looked at your curriculum to see how your simulations are integrated to make sure that this is the time to do it. You know, you're gonna have hopefully faculty support because you're helping them here. Um, and this is one of the reasons we wanted to make sure we included this in our summer speaker series um, because this is the time where you're gonna get support from, you know, your faculty, your admin to really integrate curriculum, you know, integrate simulation into your curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. How many of you have had faculty come to you and say, I need something? Just what do you recommend? What should we do? Because my, my students can't get into the clinical setting. I've got to have some hours for them. Figure it out. All yeah. the time. Yeah, all the time. All the time. I think we're the drivers now. And I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're the drivers now because they we're able to provide help. To, to your comment, Jaslyn, um, this is a great time to, um, to try to um, integrate um, simulation in the curriculum. Yeah, yeah, Raquel. And I would also say that uh, really, we do not have a choice. Our uh, clinical experience for the fall is essentially simulation and that, what best way they're for to fully come up with uh, a tabular representation of our program outcomes and our course outcomes and how best we can provide uh, the clinical experience with a concrete virtual si simulation and that is what we're trying to do now in preparation for fall. And then also jumping into Jasmine, but what, what Jasmine was saying earlier in terms of this is the best time to, to uh, really um, have our uh, program and of course our faculty work on curricular integration, because I would say we don't really have a choice right now. We have to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, it has to be purposeful. It's not just something we're going to throw to the students because it's a sim. Mm -hmm. you don't you don't want a check off, a check off box? Right. We've done this. Like I think some of the virtual um, screen experiences are sometimes used in just that way. Alrighty, we've done this. Check it off. We don't mm -hmm. pre-brief them. We don't debrief them. We just say complete this. See this patient virtually. And you're you're done. And there's to your point, it, Tonya. It is really, it doesn't. It's not really um, purposely done, and it doesn't have the same value, learning value, um, when it's done that way. Right. And so, why are we doing it? What What is the reason that supports this? Aside from the fact that we have to do something, we as educators know better. So let's make this purposeful. So I did this curriculum map worksheet when we had to go into virtual experiences. And so um, again, I was in charge of the pediatrics course. And so what we did is we looked at, or I looked at the general objectives for the vSIMs for pediatrics. And then I looked at the individual course, uh, the individual objectives for each one of the five cases for vSIM and then try to, again, go back, back and map it. Now you'll notice that I don't have the column for um, the, the specific concepts, and I just put in the, the simulation learning objectives, again, because I really didn't have any control over this, but I wanted to see how they mapped out and what made sense. And so if we look at one of these, um, you can see here that it, I, um, the general objectives identify with number five or a line that identifies developmentally appropriate and culturally competent nursing interventions based on patient care needs. 
Um, and then here you can see again that it's either part of the general objectives or ones from specific um, VSENs. And so what's helpful in doing it like this is you can go back to the course instructors and say it doesn't really make sense for your students to be spending hours upon hours upon hours doing all of these simulations that essentially are addressing the same objectives. Mm -hmm. We want to broaden their experiences as much as we can to make this a purposeful learning opportunity for them. And I am all into um, deliberate practice and doing things over and over and over again. But if you're trying to think about how we can make best use of our time, is it really asking them to sit in front of a computer and click over and over and over again to meet the same objectives? So I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. I know for us, the students are so acutely aware of the difference in an actual simulation and being sat in front of a computer to do a simulation without any real purpose and they feel like it's just busy work mm -hmm. when they don't have feedback from the faculty and a real purpose and, and strategy in what they're doing. And in all honesty, they're probably right. Mm -hmm. It probably is busy work because we're trying to give them something to count for hours um, when they can't get into their clinical settings. Exactly. But if we can help everyone understand that, that this is purposeful and that there is a method that supports what it is that we're doing, hopefully, um, you know, again, knowledge is power. The more that people understand why it is that we're doing what we're doing and that it makes sense, um, the, the more likely it is that they'll be on board. Um, Hollis has asked, does anyone debrief their VSINs on Zoom or on BlueJeans? Um, so does anybody debrief their, their SIMs um, on a conference platform? Um, I will say that we do. Um, we aren't able to debrief every single um, vSIM. Um, we don't have the abilities to do that, the capabilities to do that, the manpower to do that. Um, our clinical faculty, the ones who take them into the hospitals, are oftentimes the ones who are debriefing um, the VSIMs, which, of course, um, isn't ideal um, because it is run more like a post-conference as opposed to trying to help with critical thinking and those kinds of things. Um, however, you know, desperate times call for, call for desperate measures. But we do um, intercede in, in some of them, and we debrief, and... Um, the difference in students and their engagement is just palpable. They really, really appreciate the opportunity to, to have a conversation and to talk about what it is that, that they did in terms of, of being in that virtual environment. Lena says, a concern I have is limited access to VSIM, not enough to choose from in order to be sure that you're not repeating objectives. I agree. Um, the, the nice thing about the, um, the VSIM product um, as an example, is that they do have for um, educators, they do have all of the objectives listed for both the general objectives and for each individual case. So you, you can go back, back and map it. And so um, I agree that there's not enough uh, variety to be able to meet your, the, the course objectives as you would have if it's face-to-face. Um, but that gives you an opportunity to think outside the box. So we don't have to address all of the needs with VSIM. We can, we can think about other ways of doing things. Um, I ran a virtual simulation for neonatal nurse practitioner students with nothing but an on-screen monitor. And they had to use their imaginations and it was a neonatal resuscitation. So they were literally counting and doing, you know, they were doing the CPR, they were, they were um, counting the, the respirations and doing the Neopuff. Um, and they were having to really communicate with one another in a way that they were not accustomed to because they weren't face to face. And so what they took away from that were many different lessons um, that varied from what they got in their in the face to face experience that we had just done the semester before. So thinking outside the box and doing something that that can address those course outcomes that's not necessarily prepackaged would be another fun way to, to think about it. Uh, can I explain in more detail that simulation you just mentioned? What you want, sugar? <laughs> what? Yeah, I, I think it, that was a great example. And um, I know at MC, we have a summer clinical course that we're piloting a telehealth visit for. 
And you know, I th I'm hearing a lot of great ideas and I think these prepackaged um, products are very easy for faculty and admin to control and manage. Um, but there are a lot of other ways that we can, you know, and, and we just have to be open and be willing to experiment with new things. Um, and I think with the sudden shift, we, we had to do what we, what we had readily available. Right. But now that we, we see that this is probably going to be the way that we practice for the fall and potentially for the spring, it, it's our job as educators to, to bring something new and exciting that's yeah. going to engage the students that's not going to have them, again, pointing and clicking for a prolonged yeah. period of time. And the students are, I guess the term I heard is v-simmed out, you know? <laughs> yeah, I get it. I'm v out. Yeah, we really do have to offer a variety of um, different strategies. And I think, you know, as simulationists, we all love new and different things, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would love to also hear a little bit more about what you had come up with. That sounded uh, fabulous, you know, mm -hmm. but I think that's one example. Yeah. Raquel. We developed a summer course uh, for uh, our students in, in MC, and uh, we did not um, have them buy access to vSIMS. So we had to provide them uh, various open educational resources. So it's just mm -hmm. a variety. So we found, um, of a pediatric um, post-op simulation that really worked well. It corresponded with what they're learning in, in simulations lab. They had um, integrated um, cognitive activities with that. And then we used our MC uh, nursing video simulations library. So just a variety of, of um, simulations, virtual simulations, and it worked well. Mm -hmm. And um, so far, we have not uh, heard of students being bored or vSIMed out because we were not using vSIMs at all. So it's not a repetitive practice or repetitive process, I would say. It's just a different experience every time and they, they're learning from it. Right, right, exactly. Exactly, it's, it's um, there are a bunch of resources and I'm happy to share that and recognizing that we have about five minutes left. Um, I just want to go through my last little bit a uh, couple of slides, and then I'll I'll um, I'll talk as much as I can about the neonatal uh, resuscitation and um, and answer any additional questions that you have. Oh, look, we're here to summer. Um, so uh, curricular integration again, purposeful, 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 not something that's just being put into the sim space because somebody needs it today. We're going to map this out. We're going to make it purposeful. Using the alignment grid is a really easy way to create that visual um, consistency that you can use for both the creditors, for your administrators, um, for those of you who are, who are trying to really justify and verify what it is that we're doing in simulation. So here are some of the references that I used. Um, and then I'm just going to share my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me at any time if I can answer any questions for you. I'm happy to do it. Um, just as a little plug, um, the annual review of nursing research that's coming out for next year is going to focus on healthcare simulation. Um, and so there's going to be a, a multitude of um, ammunition that hopefully you will be able to use to help um, support your mission and in, in using simulation. And so with that, I thank you very much and I'm going to take any um, additional questions that you have. All right, Tanya, if you want to exit out of this screen um, and everyone can turn their cameras back on, their audio back on if they have any comments. Um, we have literally two minutes. So if you have any <laughs> questions for Tanya, um, I, I can stay on longer and we, you know, we can talk about anything else that you might have. Um, any questions? I think it was a very interactive presentation. It was very timely, you know. I think everyone's thinking about the coming semester, and this is a, something that a lot of us are working on right now. So thank you, Tanya. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Very informative. Thank you. You're welcome. It was. All right, Lena, so I'll tell you.